Sienna, and on behalf of my board of directors, I'd like to welcome you to the old governor's mansion for this evening's event, Blues Lane Gap. I would also like to thank Lamar Advertising for their support of this event, and also Charlie Calandra with Calandros, who has sponsored our Juke Joint IPA beer following the panel discussion where we get to listen to the tunes of Mr. Henry Gray. So thank you to all of you who continue to support our events here at the Old Governor's Mansion. I would also like to thank our Director of Events, Peggy Sweeney McDonald, for her efforts tonight. And I have the exciting opportunity to introduce you all tonight to our new Director of Education, Christina Lake. Is she in here? There she is. Welcome, Christina. <laughs> You can learn more about Christina and everything that she's going to bring to Preserve Louisiana if you visit our website. And um, she might not let you leave tonight without trying to get you to sign up to be a docent for the old governor's mansion. So if you're interested, there are forms at the front desk. So we're excited to have Christina. Uh, Preserve Louisiana's mission is to promote the cultural and architectural heritage of our state through education, stewardship, and advocacy. Baton Rouge has so many unique spaces and so many cultural stories that deserve to be preserved, discussed, and documented. I applaud all of you for being here to celebrate the blues. As we work hard to retain our identity as a community, sharing our stories, preserving our spaces is of utmost importance. I urge you all to like our Facebook page to keep up to date with the efforts of Preserve Louisiana. May is National Historic Preservation Month, and we'll be hosting an informational event to outline all of the tools in preserving our stories and structures across Baton Rouge and our state. It's only fitting tonight that we would be partnering with such wonderful organizations that are here tonight. Dialogue on Race Louisiana facilitates very important conversations about race and history within our community and beyond. The Baton Rouge Blues Foundation works tirelessly to preserve our blues culture and the people behind it and brings us our annual free Baton Rouge Blues Festival. I could not be happier to welcome their new executive director, Kim Newstrom, who you'll hear more about in a minute. And Forum 35, they are the future of all of this. It is our young professionals, their energy and voice that we rely on to carry on the legacy of our rich cultural identity. It was my hope for quite some time that Preserve Louisiana could get more engaged in the Blues Fest and help bring the community more in-depth educational programming around the Blues. We are so happy to be hosting this event with our partners for the second year. Gabrielle Roussel is a New Orleans native who moved to Baton Rouge and attended LSU where she received her undergrad in anthropology. She now works at the Baton Rouge Area Chamber as manager of investor development. It's like a friend of um, she is a member of Junior League and Capital Area Reentry Coalition Advisory Council, and she serves as the VP of Diversity for Forum 35. Join me in welcoming Gabrielle, our Forum 35 representative. Thank you, Fairley, and thank all of you for being with us tonight to share in this amazing educational experience that we've all been able to set out for you this evening. Um, Forum 35 um, is a young professional organization in the Baton Rouge area, and we're dedicated to creating opportunities for young professionals to grow philanthropically, professionally, and civically. And this mission is underscored by dedication to diversity. So we are so, so excited to be able to partner with both Dialogue on Race, the Blues uh, Foundation, and Preserve Louisiana to bring you this programming tonight. And I really hope that you'll be able to take something away and understand a little bit more about the city that you live in. I know last year when I attended this event for the first time, I was completely blown away by how much I didn't know and understand about just the rich history and culture that the blues has in our, in our capital city. And so I invite you all to, to learn and discuss and just have some fun tonight. So thank you. And I'd like to introduce uh, Kim Neustrom, Executive Director of the Blues Foundation. Thank you so much, and I do want to echo um, our appreciation on behalf of the Baton Rouge Blues Foundation. And we are, um, as you all know, Fast and Furious planning for this festival, which kicks off on Saturday. And we sort of, as a foundation, feel that this is an unofficial kickoff uh, to, to all the festivities. And 
we were so happy to see the responsiveness and the amount of people that signed up uh, and had an interest in this great um, event that we're gonna have here tonight. Um, so I'm new to this position, the Baton Rouge Blues Foundation. I just started in October. I'm uh, from across the basin in Lafayette. Um, so I said I'm uh, new to Baton Rouge, but I'm very familiar with the blues. So very happy to be here. And um, I, I do want to echo um, the sentiment about the Blues Festival, that it is one of the largest free blues festivals around in the country and beyond. Um, but that does not mean it's free to put on. We have some amazing talent. We have some wonderful performers that will be here this weekend. And uh, this year we are commemorating our 25th anniversary by having our inaugural lapel pin to celebrate the blues. And we figured this was a great opportunity to give people that attend the festival um, uh, an opportunity to um, show their love for the festival. It's a $10 pen, and it's sort of your passport to the blues or your key to the blues. So while we don't uh, cordon off downtown Baton Rouge and wristband you and force you to pay an entry fee, we're asking that you do consider buying a pen and supporting the festival in that way. And we also have VIP passes for sale for those of you who are interested in a VIP experience this weekend. Um, so that's an option and I'll be around afterwards uh, to speak with you. I'd love to meet a lot of you in person. So thanks again for coming tonight. I have the honor of introducing Maxine. Um, Maxine is the CEO of Dialogue on Race Louisiana. She attended Louisiana State University where she became the first African American to live in women's housing. Her career has spanned from working in news, PR, and media development. Uh, she worked as the first woman DJ at WXOKAM, as the first black DJ at WFMF FM radio, and later as the first black reporter at WAFB TV, um, one of our uh, current media sponsors for the Blues uh, Festival. Her volunteer leadership on the YWCA Board of Directors, where she has participated in national YWCA racial justice training programs, um, has led her to the development of what now is the Dialogue on Race original series, the program that, um, that exists as it is today. Um, Maxine has been involved with a variety of efforts and initiatives. She was a board member uh, and is still a board member emeritus on the Baton Rouge Blues Foundation. And she also leads our Baton Rouge Blues Gala in, in an amazing way. And if you haven't been, consider coming in the future because it's a great event that honors blues musicians. In early 2016, she learned she was a descendant of enslaved people owned and sold to Louisiana in an 1838 sale by Georgetown University. This is how she came to be born in Louisiana. So it's with great honor that I call up Maxine Crump to uh, lead the, the rest of this panel discussion. Please welcome Maxine. So here we are turning the old governor's mansion into a juke joint. <laughs> From juke joint to a mansion. This is the way time has brought us and this is what blues has done for us. Very exciting. You might not always know the words when you hear the blues, but you always know the feel. You know, the blues may have had its roots in Africa, but it was born in the USA. The uh, Juke Joint slideshow and Juke Joint music that you heard was produced by Mervyn Crump Jr., who's sitting in the front. Stand up, Mervyn. <laughs> I may need it throughout to uh, set things back to where we want them. Um, so um, this um, bedrock of American music from the deep south has redefined music all over the world. Blues is a, America's original popular music. Blues was forged from black southerners, from conditions that segregated them into separate tribes from the rest of the country during what was called the Jim Crow era. It was legal, but I don't think anyone would agree just. Those restrictive barriers was the separation. These black southerners then forged a new language to express, protest, and communicate to the universe and to each other. 
about the hard times. Then the blues was forced out of the U.S. by establishment powers that said the lyrics were unsophisticated and unfit for young people. But thanks to the young people of, of uh, Europe who found this music spoke to them and brought it to America, and the baby boomers of the 60s once again claimed it as their own. Any baby boomers in the room? I'm among you. We did it. Now, blues is celebrated, as you can see, by prisoners and presidents. In the audience, many of you, like me, grew up with blues music, or juke joints, or blues and rhythm and blues clubs. Raise your hand if any of that fits you. All right, we got some blues and juke joint people in the house. Uh, I'm gonna name a few from my hometown because I like the names of them. Lewis Harris Blues Club, The Honey Dripper, Veal's One Way Bar, the Hideout Nightclub, which was Emmanuel Crump Sr.'s uh, bar, my dad, and Michelle's dad, Mervis' granddad, Deborah's father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sure the rest of you are either blues fans or wannabes. We'll make sure you're a blues fan before you leave here tonight. Thanks to the Baton Rouge Blues Foundation um, and, and and I'm one of its founding members, and so is Johnny Palazzola, who is outside right now, uh, for expanding and celebrating this blues locally and worldwide. And thanks to Preserve Louisiana and its support for the Blues Foundation. And thanks to Forum 35 and its diversity committee uh, that supported this forum from the very beginning. In fact, uh, they're the ones who named it Blues Lanyard. Dialogue and Race Louisiana works to ensure that authentic history is a part of change and that blues came about uh, from race segregation and despite its harshness, has become a treasure forged from heat and pressure. As Muddy Waters say, and now the world's gonna know what it's all about. And we're paying special tribute to the juke joints that had a huge part in shaping and expanding the blues. Get ready for an amazing experience. Listen to the history of juke joints, the story of someone, the owner of a juke joint, and a blues artist who has benefited and helped spread the blues. And later you'll enjoy blues by a legendary performer live who was a part of the juke joint era. He's right on the front row there, Henry Gray. Henry Gray! Now I'm gonna introduce you to the panel. I'm gonna introduce each one of them, then I'm gonna come back and have a conversation with them. So, Kathy Hambrick, on this end, is the Director of Interpretation and Chief Curator of the West Baton Rouge Museum in Port Allen, where they now have a live functioning juke joint exhibit. She's also the founder of River Road African American Museum, which opened in 1994 following her return to Louisiana in 1991 from California, where she worked for IBM as a systems analyst. For the past 25 years, she has dedicated her life to educating the public about Louisiana's rural and culture in the sugar parishes along the Mississippi River. Kathy has numerous awards for her community service, preservation work, and her work as a curator. In 2016, she co-curated an exhibit that received the American Association of State and Local History Award of Merit. She was appointed by Governor Mike Foster to the Mississippi River Road Corridor Commission and was recently appointed by Governor John Bell Edwards to the Louisiana Archaeological Survey and Antiquities Commission. Amory holds a master's degree in museum studies from Southern University in New Orleans. She's the past national president of the Association of African American Museums and served on, on the task force for the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Welcome, Kathy Hamilton. <laughs> Now let's meet Kevin McCormick, perhaps the youngest owner of a juke joint in the world. <laughs> and only perhaps the oldest juke joint, at least in this area, maybe in the world. The Robin Hood Bar in Gonzales. Anybody from Gonzales here? Kathy? <laughs> the the uh, Robin Hood Bar opened in 1952. His grandparents, Alberta and Harold Wilson, opened it. The juke joint was in the front, and they lived in the back. That's what a juke joint is. 
By the 1960s, they had saved enough money to build a home, which they located next to the Robin Hood bar. Later, their daughter ran the bar, which the family called the shop. Their daughter, Deborah, and um, Kevin's parents, Deborah and Coleman McQuarren, had one son, Kevin. And you can see he inherited the blues, and now he has inherited the juke joint. The, the bar was turned over to him in 2010 by his grandparents with the blessings of his mother, who still manages it. In the years since the Robin Hood has been open, they have gone through five jukeboxes. And they occasionally have live bands in the Robin Hood. Now, in addition, Kevin is the owner of Phantom Light, a production company specialized in video creation and event streaming. McCorm writes, produces, and directs television shows, documentaries, music videos, and short films. He has written scripts for Cartoon Networks and DC Comics. He won the Award of Merit from the American Association for State and Local History for his documentary, Horn High School. How We Loved It. Horn High School, How We Loved It, says documentary. And his debut short film, Me, Mom, and Dad, received five 48-hour film project nominations. McCorn also served as the online entertainment editor and chief videographer of The Advocate, as he has received awards for his socially relevant production work from the Southern Newspaper Publishers Association, Louisiana Publishers Association, and the Associated Press Managing Editors. Welcome, Kevin McCorn. Now I'd like to introduce April Nicole Jackson, a Southern Sashy Soul Diva. <laughs> also known as Sexy Red. Born and raised in the inner city of Baton Rouge, went to East Baton Rouge Fair Schools, Southern University where she studied finance, and it was her mother, Miss Roxy, who noticed the quality of April's voice when she would hear her singing along with TV commercials. She started bringing April to Sunday school and from there, she started singing in the choir and special church events. April spent time focused on her career in finance. But at age 36, she had once again found her love for singing again, choosing blues, rhythm and blues, and southern soul music. As she found herself moving around the Baton Rouge music circuit, Sexy Red found out that her powerhouse voice would bring crowds to their feet. April graced many musical stages before becoming a recording artist herself. Her mother had a chance to hear April first two hits before passing in July 2012. Ms. Roxy said, those are hits, baby. And the rest is history. Through April's affiliation with BMI Records, she created Red Review Entertainment, where she is CEO and manager. She was nominated for Female Vocalist of the Year at the 2016 ZBT Music Award in Houston, Texas. Her musical journey has extended from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to Mississippi, Chicago, Houston, Virginia, and Florida. She's releasing a new album this year, unless it's already been released. She is well known in the music industry and has performed with many of the blues and Southern soul artists. And I will get her to tell you about all of the people she's performed with and some of the songs on our album. Right now, meet April Sexy Red Jackson. Now, after my conversation with the panel, we're going to turn it over to you to ask them some questions. So we're going to leave a few minutes for you to uh, see what you'd like to know from this outstanding panel. And afterwards, we will hear the blues live as it used to be played in the juke joints with Baton Rouge's legendary Henry Gray. So let's get started. So, I'm going to start with Kathy, because, because um, as you heard Gabrielle say, she was here last year and learned a lot. So you're going to have a chance to do that this year, too, because uh, Kathy is going to give you some history of juke joints. And um, so I'm going to get Mervyn to come up and restart that uh, segment that has the uh, pictures of uh, West Baton Rouge uh, juke joints. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, ask Kathy her first question. Um, so we look to you, Kathy, now to give us the history of these esteemed and sometimes uh, dangerous establishments. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
But y'all know they did cutting and shooting and, and throwing bottles and things like that. That happened too. Um, and so, you know, we, we like the truth. And so, l let me see, what is that history and the sheer magic of juke joints? And how are they different from nightclubs? So I want you to start with that history, Kathy. You got your mic on? So first of all, I want to say that the idea for the juke, for the juke joint at the West Baton Rouge Museum um, came uh, from Kenny Neal. And so he said the only thing that was missing as a part of our tour, as we interpret uh, slavery to civil rights, was the, the music part of it. And the music part of West Baton Rouge included the history of his father, Rafael Neal Sr., and all of those men and women uh, at the establishments um, where his dad played in West Baton Rouge Parish and in the rural area of Sugarcane Country. Um, fortunately, the director that we had at that time um, knew about the building that was right across the street from our parking lot there at 6th and Louisiana Avenue in West Baton Rouge. It was on the property of the, uh, the uh, American Legion Hall, and it was an old Boy Scout hut. And it wasn't a Boy Scout hut for African American Boy Scouts, but it was an old Boy Scout hut. One thing that I've learned about Jew joints is nobody really plans to build one. I, I can say that I, I haven't found in my research anywhere that anybody said, oh, I'm going to build me a Jew joint. They typically refurbish or recycle old buildings. So whether it's an old shack, whether it's, um, oh goodness gracious, I think they've probably taken everything but a church and turned it into a Jew joint. Um, one of my favorite places that I've heard of and that I know about is a place in uh, Sunshine, Louisiana that was called the Rum Buggy Inn. And it was actually a school by day, like a one-room schoolhouse by day. And then at night, you know, they come I don't know if they set up a, a, a bar where they roll the bar out and they can turn the school desk into, into a bar, but it became a bar at night. So whether it was a grocery store, or what we called a sweet shop, or a restaurant, or someone's old house, um, old barn, um, old buildings that looked like this, made out of a tin roof, had wooden floors, had hold, holes in the wall, that's what became two joints. It was a bit of a challenge for me being a curator and trying to, when I was given the assignment once I was hired at West Baton Rouge two years ago, my first assignment by Angela Bashman, the director there, was to curate the juke joint. Well, what I learned is that you can't really curate a juke joint because we're trained to organize things and to label everything. Well, juke joints aren't like that. Juke joints are spontaneous. So you will never find an owner of a juke joint, and maybe Kevin can testify to this, and certainly if you've been to Teddy's, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you do not decorate a juke joint. It's like somebody brings you something and you find a staple or a tag or some tape and you put it on the wall. Now the only decorative item in a juke joint might be the Christmas lights. And you know, you might start putting up the Christmas lights trying to get them in a straight line, and then you just say, oh hell with it. You know, I gotta get back to the bar. So you don't really decorate a juke joint. So I had a real hard time trying not to organize things. But I wanted to be able to tell the story of the people and the music that we all love. And I had to go out into the community and interview elder people like Mr. and Mrs. Charlie Granger, Charlie and Margaret Granger, and Kenneth Washington and Miss Wilhelmina DeQueer, and they're in their 80s. So I know that I had been to clubs that we might call juke joints if you've ever been on that Mississippi Blues Trail. You know, you kind of go into artificial juke joints. You know, because real juke joints came from the spontaneous need for African Americans who were newly free in those years following Reconstruction. So we're talking about 1877 to about 1965, the Civil Rights Movement. So before 1877, as people lived on the plantations and, and worked in the cotton fields and sugarcane fields, there was nowhere that they could go, save for entertainment. 
So they created these places as a place for freedom, where they could go and express themselves and talk about politics and romance each other without having an overseer standing over them, telling them what they could eat, when they could eat. And they created this music and created these buildings from scraps of metal and old cypress boards and old abandoned buildings so they could go there and feel the freedom of creating music from the memories and from the souls and from their own consciousness of what they brought with them from Africa and from the songs they sung in the fields and from the gospel music and these Negro spirituals. It was a freedom that was created in these buildings that has become the music that we know today. Kathy, um, people think of juke joints as romantic these days. And although they were places to let down and feel good, but for black Southerners, it had a practical function and could even at times be dangerous, which you heard me say. But, they, but the sheer magic of them evolved over time as they became popular across the country. The New York Times wrote in a 1981 article that juke joints were places of shared cultural mixing where blues styles were shaped. Talk about that evolution. And I think you have someone here uh, who uh, can attest to juke joints uh, evolution. Well, you know, you talk about shared cultural experiences and something that I wanted to know from those elders that I talked about, but that I mentioned earlier, I said, well, you know, what kind of people went to the juke joints? So you talked about them being kind of dangerous. <laughs> well, in, in, a, in several of my interviews, I was told, yeah, you could get cut at the juke joint. <laughs> you know, it's like dangerous. It's like, yeah, you could get cut going out the juke joint. Now, I can't tell you how many stories that, that I've heard about, you know, yes, yeah, the night went on, more and more people started drinking. Sometimes there was a little gambling going on. Maybe somebody was shooting craps in the back room. Somebody owed somebody money. Somebody was dancing with somebody's wife. And before you know it, in the parking lot or somewhere, somebody might have got, might have been cut. So, I mean, it was a part of the culture of the Jew joint. Anywhere there's gambling and drinking, there's, there's liable to be some danger. Um, but it was really interesting hearing these people talking, talking about the danger, the excitement in their voice, and they can remember the fun they had. And especially talking to people like Mrs. Barbara Granger, who said she was 16 or 17 years old and wasn't supposed to be at the Jew joint in the first place. And that's why your parents didn't want you to go, because juke joints were adult places. There was sometimes some pretty intimate dancing going on. <laughs> the word juke itself means to dance. It's an African word, it means to dance. So you go there and you're romancing someone, and the, that music made you want to move. And the music all the time was not fast music. It was a loving music. It was a music that wanted people to be get close to each other. And I don't know, and I can't talk to you about juke joints without talking about people grinding on each other. Okay, so there's adults in here, right? Don't children. Right? Okay. So juke joints were adult places. People grind on each other. They danced all over each other, flipped people over their shoulders, legs went up, panties were showing. So, you know, but that was a part of the fun of the juke joint. So it's hard to recreate the spontaneous interaction that people felt as they listened to the music and as they loved each other in these places as they talked about how they were going to protect each other as a lynch mob might be coming across the cane fields. And they, as they talked about how they were going to move to Chicago, as they listened to the musicians coming back and forth from Chicago and St. Louis back down to West Baton Rouge, to Irwinville and Lobdale and Rosedale and Chamberlain and all of those places along the Mississippi River. 
it has just been absolutely amazing that people like Buddy Guy and Bobby Rush and Bobby Blue Black all of these musicians that I've come to love all of my life, to know that they actually played in these little spots that had 10 groups. And Buddy Guy got his start with Rafael Neal Sr., playing in the Rafael Neal Sr. band, playing for $3 a night in the juke joints of West Baton Rouge Parish. I'd love to be able to ask him in an interview about those gigs that he played for $3 a night with the Rafael Neal uh, Sr. band. Well, I can definitely say that uh, all that you said is true, and the fact that it is esteem. Those places are, are held in high esteem. So something about being that wide open must have been very important. And maybe it still is to a lot of people because it's still our treasure. So Kevin, um, I grew up in a family, nightclub. It wasn't a juke joint, it was a blues, blues bar. So where I live, many people found it unique. You know, when I tell people that I, my dad had a blues club, they find that unique. I can't imagine the uniqueness of having a juke joint heritage. So um, how did you see growing up with a blues, with, with a, a juke joint? What did your friends say uh, about your parents' uh, club? Because you, you know, we got pictures of you when you were a little kid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 the juke joint was there, and there you are at three. Well, um, my friends didn't really, uh, I don't even see me as a young boy. Um, so I was quiet, I was shy. Uh, that's what it is. Um, <laughs> uh, only the people whose parents came to the bar knew that I was different, knew that I, I'd seen a lot. In that I was in the bar a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's normal. That's normal for me. That's home. That's community. That's, that's family for me. So I grew up with people shooting pool, old men talking, you know, stuff. Uh, <laughs> here and then, As one way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I mean, I grew up hearing those kind of things. So uh, I, I guess that's why. I, I was quiet because I like listening more than I, I like talking. Plus, if I was quiet in the bar, I got more information. <laughs> <laughs> they told me to stop around. You know, uh, really? Um, <laughs> so, bro, I, I go back in the <laughs> That's what it looks like now. Uh, after the flood, um, it flooded in uh, the big 2016 flood. So. We got uh, four feet of water in. Um, so we had to gut everything, uh, except the roof house. <laughs> um, we gutted everything, and that's my grandma and my grandpa. But um, so we had to take all the really cool stuff that was in, and we had to throw most of it away. And it, it, it hurt seeing because the room that was in the back they stayed in, we had to just gut it. We had to clear it all out. Is that the original one there? Yeah, that's the original one. Oh, he's handsome. So, um, <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, my friends didn't know a lot. It, it was just those whose parents went, they saw the other side of this world. So, uh, so my dad always uh, told fun stories about uh, his blues club. And as Kathy can tell you, as just said, there's a lot of entertainment. A lot of stories to be told. So, do, what do you remember about stories? I know you remember the stories about hearing those men talking, but you hadn't shared with us what they talked about or what you saw. <laughs> or what are some of the things that you remember? It just, just give us at least a, a fun story, because if you don't, I'm going to tell one from our class. <laughs> wasn't hidden from me, which was good in a way, but um, I got to see a lot of the negative side, but I did get to see the community side as well. I got to see the side where something went wrong, everybody rallied to. Um, if you need, if you had any kind of need, if you needed 
car fixed or you needed something, there was always somebody at the bar who you could ask okay. about. There was always somebody. <laughs> That's actually my mom. <laughs> so, um, there was always somebody there who would be able to help you or you knew somebody. So I grew up, it was just a big family. It was a sense of community. Um, yes, there were fights. Yes, there was, you know, people, you know, who, who had wives and had families at home that everybody knew. But that's not the stuff that I really cherished. I cherished the times like that. I cherished the fun. I cherished the parties. The parties were exceptional. So um, there was always something going on, especially birthday parties. You would see these people covered in money. Like you go in and you have your party there, you were covered in money by the time you left. Um, that the old one? Yes, that's the old one. Fabulous. Yeah. Those Christmas lights. Oh, Christmas lights, that was, yeah. Oh, that was just a little, yeah, that's normal. Yeah, that was Christmas So, that's what I remember most. I don't, the fights are always, we see fights in the I remember the, the family, I remember the community, I remember, you know, like something, like for instance, the house next door, my grandmother's house, like, um, this one I was I remember everybody coming over and having sandbags and sandbagging the house. And it was everybody who you saw at the shop. You know, <laughs> the same people who came and drank or the same people that came when we absolutely knew. So that's what I remember. So when you, own, you were the owner when it flooded? Um, when they told you you were going to be the owner, did you already know that was coming? Or? Well, uh, my grandmother passed away, so um, we needed to do something with the bar, and it's such a family place. I mean, they opened it in 1952, they lived in it. It's not something that my mom was ready to get rid of, to stop being a part of. So we sat down and we talked about it. Well, I'll open it. I mean, I have my own business now. I know how to open a business. I know how to run a business. So when she knew all the back stuff, like she knows, she knows liquid, she knows how to run it. You know, that's that's her thing. But um, I knew the actual business side. So I was like, well, let's do it. Fine. We can do it. So that's what brought it along. And it was just a, a sense of wanting to keep the legacy, like keep our family legacy going. Because my grandma and my grandpa were entrepreneurs. So that's what they taught us. They taught us how to be entrepreneurs. That's all I ever did. That's all I ever saw. You know, I saw them selling. You know, I saw them selling food. I saw them selling plates. I saw them selling liquor. You know, everything. You know, I, I saw them being able to support their family off and raise us and send me to college. You know, so that's what I saw every day. So I couldn't part with that because that's something that that taught me and that's something I even taught my son because my son now he has his own soap making business. He's eleven years old. <laughs> Entrepreneur so, continuing. Yeah, so that's the kind of thing that, that was passed down to me, so we just weren't ready to part. If we come to the Robin Hood bar now, what will be our experience? Uh, family and community. Um, you get talked to immediately. You know, uh, you walk in and ask me people. You know, and, and, you know, and they talk to you about exactly what you do and who you are. And you feel welcome. So if you walk in, you automatically. How much is the jukebox now? How much is, how much money you got to put in it? Jukebox is a dollar, and I, I, I how many songs for a dollar? Uh, you get two for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> and we used to get six for four. In 1952. So um, that's another thing that you pick up skill sets when you are around a bar. Like I learned how to fix the jukebox. Like wow. I can take parts out, I can replace them, I can fix them. So you learn, you learn different skill sets too. Anyway, I'm sorry, society. <laughs> so fabulous. We're going to see if the audience has some questions for you later. So let's meet April Sexy Red Jackson. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> your mom noticed your voice. Did you already know you could sing well? Not really. Uh, as far as I can remember, and what mom was telling me, because uh, I don't remember three years old. Okay, who does? Uh, but Kevin. Mom, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kevin. Uh, mom told me uh, that a lot of the commercials that would come on TV, I would be singing them. 
And naturally, of course, as a three-year-old, your vocabulary is just not right there yet. So I would be singing the songs, and my eyes would be closed. And my mom said that, you know, back in the days when she was going to gym joints and listening to singers, if they felt the passion in the song, they would be singing with their eyes closed. So she knew automatically, okay, let me put you in church and let you sing in the choir. <laughs> so that's how that happened. Right. So you go into this career of finance and you work for a lot of years and you knew you had been singing in this, this, this powerful voice and you had the support of your mom. And when did it come to you that you really wanted to get back into it and get out there and perform? Um, my history of working in finance, I had actually started working for uh, Hibernian National Bank way back uh, as a mortgage home processor. And because my background is numbers and I started at some university, I actually started in mechanical engineering, believe it or not. And uh, because of my math aptitude, I'm like, you know what, let me switch this around. And I started actually working for banks after school. And uh, if you guys remember Premier Bank, Sunburst Bank, I'm telling my age now, <laughs> Union Planners Bank, okay. Then, uh, let's see, it was Bank One, Chase, J.P. Martin Chase. So I had such a long history in banking, but throughout working in the banking industry, I still was going to the clubs, I still was going to the gym joints, I still was listening to all types of music, and I said, you know what? This is going to be a plan B. I got a plan A down pat. I got a plan B. So Kathy, I said, you know what? I'm a singer. Let me make that extra money on the side. I got a young baby, and I got to take care of her. So hey, I said, you know what? It's time for me to fall back on plan B. So that's when I started doing the singing. Some of the events at the bank, they were calling me. We need you to perform. I'm like, really? And so it, that's how it happened. And I just kept doing it, doing it. But um, I didn't leave Louisiana. This is my home. A lot of us, we get into the music industry and we start singing. And then all of the commercialization and all of the hype comes about. And I told this to someone maybe just a week ago when they asked me, are you going to actually leave? No, I'm not. Because if I wanted to leave and make music my livelihood, which it is 50%, I would have left at 23 years old. I'm here to stay. And you can still be famous here. <laughs> and the world will want to know. <laughs> and you're so you performed with a lot of people. In fact, you performed at the uh, Blues Gala last year with Chris Thomas King when he called you up. And you definitely brought the crowd to the to their feet. Oh my God. And you're going to be performing at the uh, Baton Rouge Blues Festival this yes. uh, this weekend. Yes. Yes, I will. So so talk about your performance. You're you're on stage and you know that this music was was a, was there when you were born, and and you just fell right into it. And um, as I said earlier, if the shape of the blues changed and evolved over time, that's why we have rhythm and blues and uh, Southern Soul Blues and that. Um, when you think about how you express it, you said that part of your expression of the blues is your inner city roots. Talk about that connection. Okay. Um, I was raised in, I guess, uh, you call it Dixie. If some of you know, here in Baton Rouge, it was called Dixie, right off of Point Road, in between <laughs> Scenic, and I remember Exxon was called Standard All at the time. Uh, I actually I did research and it was called ESO way back in the cut. But around that time, especially in the neighborhood, on Saturday, starting on a Saturday, and especially at the church on Sunday, we would be playing outside and hearing people, you know, with their doors open, playing nothing but blues. And mom had a massive collection of blues. I was raised listening to blues and gospel. And, you know, the flood did a lot because we lost everything. Uh, myself, I lost everything. 
but I think it was me. Thank God. Um, re being reared in the inner city, I was able to get that exposure of the nightclub scene, the club, now listen to this, nightclub, club, juke joint, hole in the wall, okay? <laughs> and all this was like, it, it hit me because I'll tell you what mom did. Mom said, you know what, it's good to have all this book sense, but you need some common sense. I think I'm gonna take you to Dark 30. What is Dark 30? Now see, he's laughing, he know what I'm talking about. <laughs> dark 30, what is that? She's like, just be quiet, child, get in the car. <laughs> so she took me, I think I was about 24 around the time, and she took me to a hole in the wall, which that's what I called it, to be honest with you, I think it was a juke joint. I actually think it was a blues juke joint because all they played was blues in the club. Um, it was called Hooks on a Canyon Thruway. <laughs> and across the street was Brown's Last Chance. Uh, until this day, I still don't understand the last chance. <laughs> <laughs> but it was dark 30 and you know, after sitting down with mom later in the years and asking her about Dark 30, she finally broke the code to me. She <laughs> said that Dark 30 is the time between 5.30 and 7.30. Because during the week, if you're out in the clubs and the jump joints, you got to head home by 8 o'clock because either the wife is mad and she's aggravated and you know you're not going to get no loving later on, and then you got to get up early in the morning to go to work. So, dark 30. <laughs> okay? So, we go to dark 30 and we stop in Hooks first. Now, this is inner city. We go in Hooks, and I'm looking and I'm like, man, I'm having fun and yeah, and I'm dancing. And I'm seeing all these people swinging all over the place and they're playing, you know, Bobby Blue Black Band playing and Bobby Rush and B.B. King, and I'm like, I got all this music at the house. So I started listening to it more and more. Then, after you get enough of drink in you where you're not leaning to the side to get to the car, you leave your car at Hooks and you go across the street to Browns. <laughs> so now, just by me talking about it, you got one last chance. <laughs> right from Dixie, it's called Club Infinity. And it's not a joke joint. It's, it, it is a hole in the wall, <laughs> all right? You know, I feel like this, if the walls are black and the floor is cracked up, you know, like some of our streets here in Baton Rouge, it's a hole in the wall, okay? But she, she took me there and they had a jam session going on. And that was the first time I ever experienced singing at a jam session. And mind you, I had so much music in my system that mom pushed me. She said, go on up there. I was like, I thought I'd see you in the church. Man. I said, I'm sitting out here in the club with you. <laughs> she said, ah, your voice is made and designed by God to be heard everywhere. Go up. Oh. So I walked up there, Miss Maxine, mm -hmm. and I met Harvey Knox in the soul spectrum that night. He played here last year. Yes. Yes. And the keyboards, he said, well, hey, Sugar, what's your name? I said, April. He said, well, what's your stage name? So I'm looking over, I'm like, stage name? What are you talking about? I said, I don't have a stage name. 
And then he said, well, what you want to see? And so I said, I want to see you clean up woman by Betty Wright. He said, what? I said, well, if y'all don't know that, then I'll take you there by the staple singers. He said, huh? <laughs> and then I said, all right, since you want to play this game, I know what I'm going to say. Aretha Franklin, let me get some respect. He said, that's it. So then he said, well, you know what? I'm going to give you a stage name. I said, okay, what is it? He said, well, what would your friends call me? Just some of them call me Red. He said, you sexy Red. <laughs> <laughs> so I look back at mom. I said, man, just call me sexy. She said, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, so that's that's how it started, right in the city, right in the, the middle of North Baton Rouge, and I'm just thankful that she took me to Dark Thirty. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. All right, we're on Dark Thirty time now. <laughs> So maybe you all have something you want to uh, ask the panel, but first I want you to give them a hand. Woo. I also want to say you, were, you have been recorded. So you didn't know that? You have been on screen. I'm sorry I didn't notice the camera. And you also have a, a newspaper reporter here with a bad reader. You'll be writing about you. And uh, the uh, director of the West Baton Rouge Museum is here, Angelique Bergeron. You need to stand. They can't see you raising your hand. Thank you. We have some Blues Foundation board members here. I saw you. This is, this is raising the hand thing. They can't see you. Okay. And That's Mom Abby is do. doing that. We have some preserved Louisiana board members here. I love Michelle, I think, has left. Mike Wasco, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great. All right, the board members standing in the back of these one. There's one. And then Forum 35, we have some board members also. Do y'all understand? All right. And founder and member of the Blues Foundation, Johnny Palazzo. Right over there. So what do y'all want to know? What do you want to ask this prestigious panel? Um, right here. Cameron, do you all still sell hot sauce? Hold on, Stephanie. She's coming. <laughs> Hang on, Stephanie. Yes, do you all sell hot sausage in the club? Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's a great question, Stephanie. Because <laughs> it ain't a juke joint if it ain't got hot sausage, mustard, and crackers. <laughs> so you, you've listed a number of different types of club blues club, juke joint. Club, nightclub, can you list out the distinction between these types of places that would distinguish the blues club from a juke joint from a hole in the wall? <laughs> yeah, I, start, I start off by answering that question. I was told that the juke joint, you didn't need to get dressed to go to the juke joint. You could go to the juke joint, dre juke joint dressed as you were. A nightclub, you, you would dress up. You would take your wife. That I bought real bad. You would take your wife. You That's how you dress to go to the nightclub. That's how you dress. <laughs> Fifty-year-old, strong, retired, fighting life, and told me to take the hat. And my dad, he had to know my family. We appreciate the blues in the town of White Castle. I'm the mayor pro tem, and I salute my family for teaching me to appreciate God first and enjoy music. Thank All right. <laughs> The difference. You, juke joint, you go, you danced to get funky. <laughs> I mean, I can't talk about juke joints without using some of this juke joint language. Absolutely. Uh, otherwise, nightclubs, you went, you sat around, you kind of frisky, you didn't want to sweat. Juke joints were made to sweat. Well, and also, like, um, uh, just from my experience, um, you come to work clothes. I took the you come right after work. You wear it doesn't matter at all. You come, you drink, you laugh, you joke, you dance, you get good. It doesn't matter. Do you know what kind of beer they sold in 1952? We know back then. What kind of beer y'all sold? Uh, I, I remember Falstaff. Falstaff. Yes. Yes. Okay, okay, I got a Falstaff story. Okay, my dad's so my dad's club was open in 51. So in 1951.
one, they have this man named Kiku who come to the club. And he come to the bar, he said, Mr. Crump, give all these fellas a beer and bring me a false down. <laughs> You know, part of the younger, I'm not a millennial, y'all. Uh, I'm not a whippersnapper either. I can be. But anyway, uh, for me, it was more, now I've sung in juke joints more now as of being older than when I was younger. Because younger, the 20s, the early 30s, it was clubs and home in the bars. And you're right. The club, you go all dressed up and everything. You didn't want to move too much, but you squirt in your chair because the sound. I don't know where you got that from because I was over here then. We danced. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't squirting in the chair. I definitely, you with us. So, <laughs> for me, being a singer, you know, sometimes I would be, you know, after a while, I'm like, okay, y'all can sit down and not have fun. I'm going to have fun. And I would dance and grab a hand. And, you know, by the time I grab one hand, the whole floor is packed. <laughs> Open up. But my experience, uh, and I can tell you, Teddy's joke joint. Exactly. I, I had just closed my office, and I didn't change my clothes. I still had on the, the suit, the cute shirt, <coughs> dress pants, and the heels. But I always kept some flip flops and another shirt in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and I pulled up there, and I believe it was uh, Will Jackson there. Uh, Lil Ray Neal was there that night, uh, and Selvin uh, Cooper. And they were there playing, and I pulled up and walked in, and Lil Ray looked at me and said, so you coming to work? <laughs> I said, no, I'm coming to enjoy myself. We got to take all that off. I said, then what do I do about that? He said, baby, go get loose. It's a hole in the wall, just joint. We about to have us some fun. <laughs> so I said, no problem. Went to the car, changed, and you know what? I had the best time. I had the absolute best time to see all that junk in that just joint. <laughs> Walking around, looking at, I saw tricycles I used to ride. <laughs> oh my God. And all the license plates. Yeah. I'm like, Teddy, did you really go to all those places? Maybe you asked the wrong question. I'm like, oh my God. And the Christmas lights, year round, 365 days a year, it's Christmas in Teddy's Juke Joint. So that, that particular Juke Joint, it resonates with me because that was the first Juke Joint that I actually sung in. That was the first Juke Joint that I actually sweated in. And I'm talking about sweat, but I felt good sweat. And then that's also the first Juke joint who actually, by the time that I got so far off in my career, he's the first Juke joint that actually put my picture up on the wall. Wow. Yeah. So I'm sitting there with all the greats and Kenny Neal and Ray Vanille and all B.B. King, and he has my picture right when he walk in the door, right next to the actual teddy bear, and I'm sitting right there. So I was like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> so Kathy, you know, one of the things we said was that um, um, the, the drift joints shaped the blues. So there was a merging of blues cultures, that blues had an evolution uh, as it moved through other parts of the country. And I think uh, you mentioned to me that the man that spoke at the uh, museum yesterday is from an area where there were juke joints. So we're talking about moving from the south to other parts of the country. Did you ask him to share a story with us? Yes, Introduce well, him and ask him. Yes, our special guest at the West Baton Rouge Museum uh, yesterday for our lunchtime lecture is a uh, senior historian for the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. And so he talked about his childhood and Mr. Carl Westmoreland, who's sitting there next to John Michael Lockhart, um, I would just like to ask you, you grew up, I mean, sounded like you grew up almost inside the juke joint. 
can you just tell us about Cincinnati? Because I thought you joints were only a rural thing. Gibbs Tea Room was next door to my grandmother's house. Wow. <laughs> and the magic moment where the Asley brothers learned to perform was on the next street. Uh, and Mississippi Mud played uh, blues guitar in the, in the in between sets. Uh, and then, as I grew up, and when I was in college, I went to a jazz band in Tennessee, and we would trade sets with uh, blues artists in house joints, uh, in nightclubs, and of course, upstairs in the Elks Club. Can you imagine us going up the steps with a B3 organ, wow. <laughs> two floors? And play three sets and then I have to haul it back down. <laughs> uh, the night I graduated, did my undergraduate, got my undergraduate degree. Dr. King spoke at Knoxville at our graduation. And then we played at the Elks and we hauled the organ upstairs for three flights. Then pulled it back down. Then I got my parents' uh, car, you know, going home, going back to Cincinnati. And I went by by to the three flights of steps. But the juke joints and the places of assembly were places of relief for us. Uh, places where we found solutions um, in addition to being able, I can't dance. I'm one black man, I can run, I can take it to the hall, I can't dance. <laughs> but I hit on the good lady while you out there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. So, in a sense, we can see. Did the moon start to take on the sound of different areas? Uh, that's why you hear some blues artists name themselves from different areas. Memphis Slim, Fillmore Slim, who will be at the festival. Uh, he's from Baton Rouge, but Fillmore Slim will be playing at the Baton Rouge Blues Festival. So, more questions? Yes, Joyce, Joyce Jackson, everyone. Was on the panel last year, blues historian. Well, I just wanted to say that I've heard April sing in a drip joint at Teddy's, <laughs> and I've heard her sing at a what they call a white party. It's a big celebration that everybody has on white in the Civic Center in Amid, Louisiana. And I wanted you to talk about the differences in how you perform in, in respect to your audience and how your style might oh, change yeah. a little bit depending on your audience or you know the context that you're singing in. You know, you had to give it up for Miss Joyce because I knew she was gonna ask me. <laughs> With like three levels. <laughs> I love her. Um, good question too. As she was talking, I remember the juke joint where I sing nasty. <laughs> and I talk about you. And I look at all the women and I say, hey, where are all the sexy ladies at in the house tonight? Raise your hand. And all the ladies, here I am, right here. <laughs> and then I'll come back. Now, we're talking about juke joint now. And then I come back and say, where are all those tall drink of waters? Where are all the men at with a size 15 shoe? <laughs> they wouldn't wear the <laughs> Then I come back and say, well, if you got a 10 and lower, raise your hand. Get everybody got a 10. <laughs> then there be woo, 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 and all that stuff. So that's the juke joint side. And I would give the sassy soul songs. You know, the Aretha Franklin's and, you know, do the covers that really touch touch those souls. Then we talk about the all white partners, you know, the way you all, you know, dignified. And then for some strange reason, I'll tone it down, but right in the middle of the performance, I'll stop and I'll start talking. Because I am a talk to y'all for you. But the style of the songs or the music or the tone you know, at a, uh, uh, maybe even a ball. You know, I, I found this about myself. I know how to adjust. I know how to adjust based off of the, the audience because I look at the audience, I look you in your eye, I talk to you. And when I talk to you and I communicate with you, I know exactly what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing it for so long 
that you could sit me in front of 5,000 people and I could make all of them sing back to me. So that's one part of it. Then the other part of it, which I think you mentioned, Joyce did? Yeah, she mentioned something else. Um, take for instance downtown uh, in an open event. Okay, so that's a whole different genre there. You got blues lovers, you got R and B lovers, you got southern soul, you got country, you got pop, you got rock. What I do if I'm performing at an event like that, I make sure to serve everybody. So the last time I performed at, well, not here, but I was out of state. And the crowd was so mixed and diverse. So the only song that I could come out with was Rod Stewart's If You Think You Sexy. Oh. <laughs> and they were, when, the, when the song started, dun, 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 dun. everybody was like, she about to sing that! <laughs> and I just went off with the song, and I gave the microphone, I said, I love audience of participation. If you think you're sexy, say I'm sexy. So do you think you're sexy? I'm sexy. <laughs> hey. You are sexy. <laughs> so when I started noticing that power, I held on to it. And I performed on some stages, Miss Maxine, where I look out in the crowd and I can't see people. That's just how I'm doing. Wow. I opened up for Mars Day in the Time back in 2013 at really? the Blues Festival, or the Crawfish Blues Festival in Biloxi, Mississippi. And that was my first time actually performing, you know, in front of a massive crowd. I think the attendance was like in the upper 50,000. And that was my first opportunity to perform at such a major venue with so many people. And they didn't tell me that I was going to open the show. <laughs> so they decided to look at me and give me the microphone. And I'm like, so I walked out, I'll never forget this, I walked out on the stage, natural course, I'm in the back, so I don't know who's out there. And I walked out on the stage, walked in the middle, I didn't let them know I was shocked and stunned and scared, you know, ready to run back off the stage. But I actually turned around and I looked at everybody and I said, what you looking at? <laughs> All the people there was just, they fell out laughing. It was the biggest icebreaker. And then from there, I was like, okay, I'm going to handle a big crowd tonight. <laughs> Make you laugh, then give you a song. And the way I feel about it, peace, love, music. Those three things is what makes me deliver. All right. One more, Matt. And there was somebody in the back. Matthew, you could not call on him between you and me right now. Yeah, and then there's, there's, there's one whose hand came up at the same time as Matt. I had a lot. <laughs> That's great. Uh, for, for anybody, uh, 25 years from now, more juke choice or fewer juke choice? <laughs> Business side, I think it's a few. Just because it's a legacy that not everybody is interested in hearing about. Because two jokes are hard. I mean, they're a lot of fun. But for someone to run it, it's you run it all day. Like, and, and all night. Like, my mom, she gets there sometimes at 11 o'clock. Well, she gets close at 2 o'clock. But isn't it also true that there's really no, not too much reason to? Open up your joint because it's a it's a it's a multi-use building that you're doing. You just build a club, a blues club. Right. Right. Yeah, and that's that's so I mean, but just looking at it from this perspective, it's 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 a lot of work, and to carry it on, it takes it takes special people because sometimes they don't make a lot of money, um, especially if you have a smaller crowd. I mean, if you have those those <coughs> people who come every day, you may only spend ten dollars a day. You know, and they have a few people throughout the day, but they're ready. They'll sit there all day and talk. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah. You know, so it just takes a special person, a special place to actually make it. 
over there in the back. Yeah. There he is. I want to, can I say something in the Sure, go ahead, question. What happened, if this question was asked, I'm sure, by somebody 50 years ago, you know, say in 1960, you know, in 25 years, will they be June joints? What happened with the evolution of music was as disco came on the scene, R&B came on the scene, disco came on the scene, um, the music changed. People didn't like the blues as much. And so that's what happened to Juke Joints. Juke Joints were the place where you went to listen to the blues. When the disco balls started showing up and the CDs and the Juke Joints started showing up instead of the 45s, live music instead of techno music that's done in studios, that's what, what happened. So we can ask ourselves today, Will there be more juke joints? My question is, will there ever be more original, authentic music that comes from the spirit of human beings instead of from computers? Nice question, Daniel. Yeah, Ethan Balonsaw. Um, so I am actually from much further south in Jacksonville, Louisiana. And I had, I was blessed to know all of my great grandparents except for one. So I appreciate you saying how dangerous some of these clubs were because my great grandpa was in shot in one of the at home bar dance halls. Um, but one of the questions I have is that my great grandparents lived on the plantations in the 30s and the 40s, um, and they talked about how they would go to their Zotico Acadian dance halls also in the mix of people that would be there. One of the questions I had was, I'm not familiar with juke joints in Baton Rouge area, but what was the, the demographics like inside of these clubs? Was it strictly African American, or was there some, some mix and some unity inside? Kathy? Well, remember what I said, as a historian, I've studied where juke joints originated. They originated in the cane fields, and these were workers on the plantations. Uh, it was during the Jim Crow era. So, not to say that a white man could not go into a juke joint and have a beer. Of course he could. In some cases, the white landowner owned the building and he allowed somebody black to operate the business. But in many cases, these were businesses owned by black men and women. And they were able to build a business such as Kevin talked about with his parents and grandparents to send their children to school. Typically, I would say that juke joints, authentic, original juke joints, were black establishments. Made for black people, by black people. Not to say that white people could not go into a juke joint. Now, I've had some people tell me, say, oh, well, when I was at LSU, we used to go to the juke joint all the time. And they would talk about maybe like the Alligator by the Bar. It's not to say that you could not go into an establishment and listen to the blues. But I can tell you, those musicians that traveled the chip and circuit, and those musicians that played that authentic original music in the black juke joints, they would go and play at the, the white establishments or bars. They could not sit down in those same establishments and even buy a drink. Um, I was reading, I think it was Larry Garner's oral history, in the archives at the West Baton Rouge Museum. And he talked about going into juke joint, uh, going into white establishments that were called honky tonks. Honky tonks, the difference between a honky tonk and a juke joint, honky tonks would generally have country and western music on their jukebox. Now you might have B.B. King on the jukebox, but primarily you had maybe Zydeco music, country western music, Maybe blues every now and then. In an original juke joint, there was no country western <laughs> on the jukebox. He also talked about going into one of the white establishments in Louisiana to play, and there were pictures of Ku Klux Klansmen on the wall where his black band had to play and entertain and talk about how frightening that is. So you think about the evolution of this music, the courage of the men and women who went out to sing in these places in the dark nights throughout the South during the Jim Crow era, 
I'm sure that they were very, very happy to get back to some of the places where they felt, really felt at home. Kevin, any whites come to the Reverend Bar? Um, so, uh, just kind of add to that. Um, I think you kind of gave where you're most comfortable sometimes. So, we had every once in a while, like you saw a picture with a white kid um, with me back in the late 70s. Um, that's few and far between. Uh, we have, every once in a while, we have white customers, but they're in the black community. They're married to black men or black women. You know, so they're comfortable. Um, uh, not to say that people who aren't don't come in, it's just that it's not very often. Um, and plus the music, it's all good. So, so we're coming to the end, and I want to say that uh, to to the to the note now that from the '60s, the white baby boomers fully embraced blues, and so any blues club now, pretty much, you're going to find white people in there. Uh, and I think it's time to bring up Fairly because Fairly's going to. Invite you to the party outside that's gonna have food and real juke joint music from a real juke joint man, our legendary Henry Gray. Okay, we've got to give him another round of applause. Ms. Kathy Hamburg, Mr. Kevin Harn, and April. Sexy Red Jackson. And everybody, please, um, a big round of applause for Maxine Crump for her wonderful facilitator. Okay, so we're not done yet. So please join us in the Rose Garden. You can stop for a break if you need one. We have restrooms right past the foyer here, and then restrooms past the library as well. So you can help yourself to some jambalaya and a juke joint IPA and the tunes of Mr. Henry Gray. Thank you all so much for coming.